So I have a question to begin. We started uh, last week a four-week series called Phoenix Arise, and we we're talking about little fires everywhere last week. Today I want to talk about something else, and I want to build it into a metaphor to make the point. And the way I want to begin this morning is with a question. And here's the question. How many of you have a fire pit? Okay? So when you think about a fire pit, building a fire, there are several different kinds. You have the type of fire pit that burns on propane or sometimes natural gas, and all you have to do is turn it on and hit the ignition switch. It's sort of like the fireplace type of thing. Then you have these small little fire pits uh, that um, are made of metal and they contain a small fire. You won't see a real big fire that comes out of that fire pit. And then you have other types of fire pits that are dug around uh, and usually there's a stone around them and basically you can build a bonfire as big as you want to depending on how much wood you put on it. And... um, The key to all three of these type of fire pits, though, is they need to be rekindled. Now, in the case of natural fuel, like uh, propane and so so forth, you have to restart it again. But in the case of a small fire pit or a big bonfire, eventually it burns out. And eventually you have to rekindle it. And to rekindle it, you have to put some fresh fuel on the fire in order for it to keep burning. Now, when you think about a fire, you can think about what you're going to use as the fuel to keep that fire burning. Now, I don't know if you, how you get your fires started. Uh, they have little starter blocks that you can light and then put your wood around that. And then the other way, and I've done it quite often, I have a small little fire pit like that, is you take newspaper, cardboard, and you begin to light and then put the sticks around it and so forth. But have you ever noticed that when you do that, boy, it creates a mess. There's all kinds of ashes, and usually the wind is blowing the wrong way, and it blows the smoke right back into your face. So there's kind of a way to build a fire that has clean fuel, and there's kind of a way, I will call it, that has dirty fuel. So what you stoke a fire with is quite important. You can stoke it with trash, you can stoke it with rotten wood, you can stoke it with moldy wood, you can stoke it with poisonous wood, or you can stoke it with pure wood or seasoned wood of some sort. And the quality of the fire kind of depends upon the quality of the fuel that you use to get it started. So many times we use dirty fuel in the fire of our faith. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of rekindling hope, but you'll notice that I put a question mark beside it. And that is, the things that we do, does it really rekindle genuine hope in our hearts, or is it operating on dirty fuel? Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So, building a fire that is worthy of a phoenix rising depends kind of on what you rekindle it with. So, my message this morning is a reminder that the life of faith is a journey of constant rekindling. It's not like you build a fire once for all. Fires come down, and then you can build them back up again. And that's really true when we talk about hope as well. There are times that our heart is full of hope, and other times it's a small little flicker in our life. And I think where hope is rekindled depends quite often on what we are using to stoke that fire with. So I think I've explain this metaphor enough that we can use it, okay? So let's think a little bit about how we first come to faith. We hear the good news of Christ. We hear of grace that we just sang about. And we believe. 
And after we believe, it seems as though our entire outlook is full of hope. But over time, the wetness of the world in which we live kind of dampens that fire inside of us. And so we need to rekindle it. But have you ever noticed some people many times, what they look for to rekindle that faith in their heart depends upon some type of monumental experience. So sometimes people want to get, and I'm just using this in quotations, saved again. So they'll walk the aisle in the type of church that has an altar call. And they might do it again and again and again because their life is kind of kindling that, uh, I mean, is going down and needs to be rekindled. Uh, Something turns that fire into just kind of a pile of ashes. There's all kinds of things that get, can get people disillusioned or hurt. We come to faith and we have an unrealistic expectation many times that life is going to go grand for us, and then we lose a job or we lose our health or we lose a loved one, and all of a sudden that fire inside of us begins to die, and maybe we begin to doubt if our experience was really real or not. Um, And so many times people seek to have that same experience all over again. Uh, So they try to put back in place all the things that led them to that initial experience. So many times people will ask Jesus to come into their heart repeatedly. I've known people like that, where they go, Lord, I don't know if it took last time. I need you to come back into my life again. Um, Maybe they're afraid that they're going to be condemned. Uh, Maybe they are full of some type of guilt or shame that causes doubt. I don't know. But they, uh, they run on simplistic fuel. And what I mean by that is they run on the fuel where people uh, think that following Jesus is all about just asking Jesus to come into your life. And that's it. And I think we give a wrong portrait to other people sometimes when we share our faith that all you need to do is ask Jesus to come into your heart and the rest of your life will go great. That's not realistic. That's not the way life works. And so sometimes people are told over and over again, well, maybe you didn't really mean it. Maybe you weren't sincere. Why don't you pray the sinner's prayer all over again? And so they do and something Uh, changes for a little bit, and then it burns out again. So sometimes um, what happens is judgment comes in to other people. And that is, well, if you were truly sincere in following Jesus, that wouldn't happen. Or if you would do things the same way I do them, then your faith will continue to burn brightly. All of that is kind of built on simplistic fuel. It's sort of like the fire that begins to go down. And you and I know people like that. They get out the lighter fluid and they they squirt it on the fire to get it built back up again. Rather than rekindling the wood for it to kind of burn naturally. Well, sometimes that's what people do. And sometimes people then just kind of put their life on autopilot. Sort of like that fire that is... Uh, being, uh, is uh, natural gas uh, or propane. All you got to do is light it once and it just kind of burns until you shut it off, right? And sometimes people kind of put their life in autopilot as well. Sometimes people begin to do some real strange things. They build some very strange fires to keep their faith hope alive. So sometimes people will begin to say, hey, I use the King James Version of the Bible only. Or I only sing hymns and not contemporary music. I believe baptism is by immersion only, not by sprinkling. All kinds of crazy things. Then there's the moralistic type of fuel. Well, I'm better than you are because I don't drink or I don't dance or I don't do this or I don't do that. But in many ways, um, that type of faith does not rekindle hope at all. It just kind of 
avoids the, the terror that your fire is going out. And you use all kinds of strange ways to try to rekindle it. Most recently, I think sometimes people have done that with politics. And that is, you know, you have to vote a particular way if you're going to be a genuine follower of Jesus. Well, sometimes people do really strange things as well. They are people who want to build a fire so big that it never goes out. So, you know, some people get involved in mega churches rather than in smaller communities because they like the feel of that strange fire of bigness. Uh, they have their favorite preacher or priest or rabbi or imam, and uh, what they say is the way it is rather than thinking about their faith for themselves. They just keep stoking the fire with a lot of bad ideas and sometimes some very bad theology as well that's not motivated by love. Jesus said, love God, love your neighbor. It's that simple. They never stop to reevaluate why they're believing what they're believing and so their wood is never rekindled with a fresh experience of Jesus because they try to build this wall in some way to make sure that they're right. There is a better way to stoke a fire than using a lot of bad fuel. We have an ancient faith that has been passed down to us uh, from the apostles, the prophets, church fathers and mothers, and there are the contributions of people that are theologians, pastors, priests, scientists, psychologists, medical professionals, professionals, and sociologists as well. But you know what? Rekindling that kind of faith is a lot of hard work because you have to listen, you have to learn, and you have to grow. But it does rekindle hope because we actually see that faith can stand the test of time. So we have to evaluate the fuel source that we are using. In the two passages of Scripture that I read for us today, we see that it is rekindled through a fresh encounter with Jesus. So it takes patience to build a good fire, doesn't it? You just can't throw the wood on. You have to arrange it for it to be sustainable. And that type of fire can burn bright. It smells clean. You step out of your house and you go, somebody's burning fire in their backyard. And oh, you go, mm, that smells great, right? They may have built it the right way. They're not, they're not burning leftover trash from dinner, right? They're burning good wood to be able to rekindle that type of feeling. So the kind of faith that really rekindles itself is the kind of faith that takes time, it takes patience, it takes questioning, it takes clean fuel. You know, there comes a time in our lives when we just can't burn trash anymore. And I've been talking a little bit about how sometimes in the course of our life we have to deconstruct certain things in order to, re to reconstruct certain things. So a favorite author of mine, Brian Zahn, wrote a book a couple years back called From Water to Wine, or I think it's just called Water to Wine. And he was talking a little bit about his own life. And at one time as a pastor, in St. Joseph, Missouri, he was concerned about bi building a big megachurch. That was his fuel source, right? And he began to talk a little bit about how that type of fire or that type of faith wasn't working anymore in his life. So he wrote this book that he had a fresh encounter with Jesus back in 2004, and I'm going to read a quote of this book to you in a moment, but I want to step aside for a moment and think about, especially those of us in the Western culture, how we always think bigger is better. Bigger is better. And for whatever reason, this historical incident came back to my memory this past week. Um, what if we keep building bigger and bigger until it becomes too big to let go of. 
So there's an annual tradition by college kids down at Texas A&M where they would build a 50-foot-high bonfire every year. And back in 1999, in fact, it was November the 18th, 1999, that wood pile got so big that it collapsed in on those that were building it. I don't know if you remember this. There were 12 college kids that were killed. There were 58 that were also uh, hurt. Uh, They were working on the structure. This 59-foot high stack bonfire consisted over 5,000 logs. And for whatever reason, there was some type of excess internal stress on some of those inner logs that didn't provide the adequate strength to hold it up. So I was looking around online. I thought you might uh, enjoy seeing this. So that's how big they build this bonfire. And it was uh, something that they do on an annual basis. And then this thing happened, and I found this short little interview, uh, it's only a few minutes long, of a lady that was an alumnus of Texas A&M, and she talked about this incident. I want you to see it. So I'm Teresa Woodard. I am a reporter here at WFAA. But more importantly today, I am a member of the Fight in Texas Aggie class of 1997. Back in the day, the biggest rivalry in all of sports, if you ask me, was between Texas A&M and the University of Texas at Austin. And Bonfire was just this epic pep rally that we would hold every year right before we played what we call TU. So I remember being at every Bonfire when I was a student from 1993 until 1997, and then even after that. Because after I graduated from Texas A&M, I stayed in College Station and I was a reporter. To be a part of it the night when those burns would happen, wow. You could see people for miles, it felt like, crowding around the field out there. And you could feel the heat from the bonfire. You would watch that flame go up and up and up. And when the moment would hit at the very top of it, which was that outhouse that signified the University of Texas at Austin, when that thing would go, oh man, you could just hear the screams forever. And it just echoed. Bonfire meant so much to me that when I was moving away from College Station, which just so happened to be about a week before the bonfire fell, one of the last things I did on my way out of town was drive past Stack one more time and just marveled at it. And I thought, I vividly remember this, I thought, it's not the last time I'll ever see it. I'm gonna make sure that I move back to Texas someday and I go back to a bonfire. I started a new job in Tennessee on November 17th, 1999. On November 18, 1999, I woke up in our little apartment in Knoxville, Tennessee to news on the radio. It was the second day on the job for me at a new television station in Knoxville, Tennessee. I just moved there. And I woke up to my radio on the alarm clock and the first thing I heard was that the bonfire stack had collapsed at Texas A&M before I even got out of bed, tears started flowing. I remember the day when it happened and I remember trying to explain to outsiders what that tradition was all about. And I remember trying to explain what the Aggie tradition was all about and people just didn't get it. And there is a saying, something like, From the outside looking in, you can't understand it. And from the inside, you can't explain it. Looking back on it, I do realize now, man, that was dangerous. But until this moment happened, we didn't think about it that way. It's painful. I know it's painful for Aggies like me. Um, It's more painful for the young men and women who were students at the time. I had just graduated a couple of years before. There's people who have more vivid memories than me, I know but it hurts, 12 people. And that's significant. And Texas A&M is known for being the 12th man. And 
the fact that we lost 12 Aggies that day, there's something to that. What if the person who could have gone on to cure cancer was killed that day? Or what if the person who could bridge these deep political divides that we have in our nation right now, what if that person was killed that day? We'll never know, but as Aggies, it's up to us, and as Texans, it's up to the rest of us to just live on in their spirit and believe that we'll go forth every day and make a difference um, in their name. So the reason I showed you that video is what stuck out for me was the idea that she didn't realize how dangerous that was until looking back on it. And I do think that when it comes to faith, what we do use to kindle the fire of faith inside of us, for many people, they do not realize how dangerous some of that fuel source is that they're using until they look back on it. You know, churches that try to build a big bonfire like that sometimes become dependent upon the personalities and the charisma of those who build it rather than the community that's in that church. I finished listening to a podcast called The Fall, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill Church out in Seattle. An overly dominant mega church pastor that basically led people into a ruin of their faith because he was burning bad fuel. That story has been repeated over and over and over and over again with many mega ministries. And what we find is that it's not until you look back on it that you realize that it was dangerous. And you need to rekindle hope in a different way than maybe the fuel source that you're using. So maybe the end of one fire is just the beginning of another. So I mentioned Brian Zahn in his book, Water to Wine. He uses a different analogy than the wood like I'm using. He talks about a theological house. And he talks about how our theological house is how we think and speak about God that is revealed in Christ. And he says that we all have a theological house. Some of it we inherit and some of it we construct ourselves. Our theological house is not Jesus, but the space that Jesus inhabits in our thought and in our speech. He says, I acquired the building materials for my theological house from various sources. And then he goes on and he says this, when we look closely at our theological house, it's often characterized by sectarian certitude, Western individualism, American consumerism, and religious nationalism. He says, sometimes our theological house can become so dilapidated that it becomes inhabitable, uninhabitable. So here's what Brian said, and here's the quote that I read. He says, in the fall of 2003, I reached a place where I said, I can't live in this house anymore. I held on to Jesus, but my dilapidated house was becoming uninhabitable. I was afraid it was going to be condemned. I was too embarrassed by my theological house to invite company into it. I wasn't ashamed of Jesus, but the theological house I had built around Jesus had become an embarrassment. Theories of eschatology, theories of atonement, theories of final judgment I had inherited or picked up along the way now seemed to clash with the beauty of Christ. An unavoidable eschatology mega war in the Middle East, the crosses, uh, the father's violent anger inflicted on his son, hell as God's eternal torture chamber. These theological ideas had become too ugly to be endured. Something had to be done. The saving grace was that I was able to make a critical distinction between Jesus Christ and my theological house. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but my theological house was not. It was clear that my theological house could not remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
it was time for a major remodeling project. In 2004, I embarked on a massive theological renovation. I didn't want to demolish my faith. I wanted to restore it. It involved a lot of praying, reading, rethinking, and engaging with new voices, both ancient and modern period. It was an exciting time, though it was not easy. Remodeling my house while I was still living in it was messy and disruptive. The remodeling of my theological house was much like every remodeling project. It was much more complicated, it took far longer, and was more costly than I estimated. But it was worth it all. Pages 47 and 48. You wonder, those who saw an empty tomb like Mary, those who were disillusioned on the Emmaus Road, what were they holding to? What type of Jesus did they want? Maybe it was a Jesus that was going to remove all their problems and get rid of the Roman occupation. But what we find is these individuals in John 20 and Luke chapter 24 were troubled souls. They embark upon a faith and got disillusioned along the way. And we find that Mary goes to the tomb in John chapter 20, and it is there she sees that the stone had been rolled away. She sees that the tomb is empty, but she thought that her faith had died in Jesus because she turns to an individual that she thought was a gardener, and she says, where have you taken my Lord? Please show me where you have taken him. It never occurred to her, did it, that maybe he really was alive, that maybe he really did come back to life. Her heart, her soul, her hope was so disillusioned that it was a pile of ashes. She looks on Jesus in that garden, and she doesn't recognize him. It's a fascinating dynamic. Why couldn't she recognize him? Had her faith been so demolished that she just couldn't picture that this was Jesus until he said something. And the minute he says her name, hope is rekindled. She has a fresh encounter with the living Christ. And it's in that fresh encounter she cries out, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now what's fascinating about this, and I didn't read this part, but I think it is something that needs to be said here this morning. She wasn't going to continue to be a follower of Jesus the same way she had before. Because here, as she says Rabboni, Jesus responds to her in verse 17 of chapter 20, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And that's what Mary Magdalene did. She went back and told the disciples that this historical Jesus is now the cosmic Christ. He is Lord of all all creation through his resurrection. Don't hang on, Mary. Don't hold on. It's not like, hey, we're all going to go back into the village and have dinner together like it was before. Everything has changed, but rekindle your hope on this, that I'm alive. Rekindle your hope in your brothers and sisters by telling them you've seen me alive. Remember that Nothing can take away from me what I now have, and that is the life that has been given to me through the resurrection. Well, Mary had to rethink some things, as we all do. So I have some tips for you. When you're in the middle of what seems to be kind of a dead end, maybe it's a new beginning. Maybe it's a new start. Maybe the end is the beginning. So let me give you six things that I think are important to keep in mind here. Number one, don't be afraid and certainly don't be ashamed that your faith is changing. 
That should be assumed. It will not stay the same throughout your whole life. Number two, passing through deconstruction and reconstruction is normal. It's called growth. It's called maturing. Number three, we all have built some strange fires at points in our journey, haven't we? Things that have given us some confidence and assurance. But looking back on it, it's a bit dangerous. Number four, be aware of overreaction. Sometimes if you come to this epiphany, you come to this moment where your eyes are open, you can overreact. Don't. It's okay. It's normal. Number five, open yourself up to the whole body of Christ. You know what happens in churches? It's us for no more, close the door type thing. There are people of faith that are of different color, of different culture, of different ethnicity, and you can gain all kinds of things from the whole body of Christ. It's not just people that are like us who call themselves a particular denomination or look like us or sound like us or have the same interest. The body of Christ is worldwide, and I think there's things to be learned through all of them. Might it be your style or your particular, uh, you know, what you particularly like? Not necessarily, but you can still learn. I'm telling you, we all need a good dose of going into the black church and seeing the excitement that they have about the Lord, because we all tend to sit and twiddle our thumbs sometimes. Is it your style? Maybe not, but you can learn something about being excited about the Lord, the resurrected one. And finally, number six, be patient. A rekindled hope takes time. It's a lifetime journey, and you'll probably go through this cycle several times. Now, the other passage is of the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. And in Luke chapter 24... I find it interesting what takes place. So these two individuals are walking. They are leaving the scene of the crime where Jesus has been killed. And now it's three days later. And as they walk, there's a stranger they don't know that shows up. And he walks with them. And as he walks with them, he talks about the things that had happened. And it says in verse 15 of Luke 24, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they go on and they say, haven't you heard this one Jesus has been crucified? And basically their hopes have been dashed because it says in verse 21 of that same chapter, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. That that dream is gone. So he continues to travel with them. They come to a place where they sit down for dinner. And it's there. Their eyes are open as to who he is. It's interesting though, in between that, it says in verse 27 that Jesus begins to talk with them and he says, it says here, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. They had gotten some junk theology along the way. And they believed that this one, that's a Messiah, was coming to liberate them from Rome rather than show the heart of God's love. What we find is that at the table, when he breaks bread, their eyes are opened And they recognized him, and he vanishes from their sight, but they say this to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and while he was opening the scriptures to us? So that same hour they got up, they returned to Jerusalem, and they had a message in their heart. Their hope had been rekindled. Here's the message. The Lord has risen indeed. So how do we take this illustration and apply it to our own life. You're going to go through ups and downs. At times your faith will be strong and at times it will be very weak. At times it might even feel like it dies out. 
But the thing that will rekindle faith is not a lot of strange fire that burns on bad fuel. It is a pure fire of a pure experience again with Jesus. Brian Zond in his books often talks about what we need the most in our life sometimes is just take time to sit with Jesus. That's the term he used. Just sit with Jesus. That is, don't go to him with a long list of prayer needs. Don't go to him demanding him to do something. Just sit with Jesus. Calm down, slow down, and clear your mind and just say, Jesus, meet me here. Meet me here. And maybe that's the way we rekindle the hope that we all need. Maybe the way forward is to take the small glowing ember of knowing God loves you and let that start a new fire. T.S. Eliot wrote a long poem that I'm not going to read, but it's called uh, Four Quartets. But here's three things that I want you to take away from this poem that was written back in 1955, I believe. He says in poetic verse what I've been trying to say to you in sermonic form. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Every day is a new opportunity. The glowing ember of God's love is available to us. We shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. A fresh encounter. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flames are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Would you stand, please? As we close this morning, my prayer for all of us is to have a fresh encounter with the living Christ, not to depend upon strange fires or bad fuel, but to sit in the presence of the one who loves us, so that when all that is left is ash heap, will you allow yourself to be closed in by the flame of God's love so that you can rise like a phoenix above the regrets that we all have in our life? so that you and I can rekindle the promise for tomorrow. May the Lord bless us and keep us, make his face shine upon us. May he lift up his countenance upon us, and may he give us his peace. Amen and amen. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.